Hi, this is Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Open and honest discussions with wise and skillful teachers about their experiences with life, death, and Buddhism. If you wonder how others on the path have dealt with death and dying and grief, then be sure to listen in. Everybody has a story, a perspective, and a valuable lesson to share. Embrace death, live a full life, and learn how to love impermanence. Because as my dear father used to say, nobody gets out of this alive. It's time for Death Dhamma Ahas, and today I'm so excited to share with you some lessons learned from the wonderful discussion that I was able to have with Dr. Zeth Zueho Sigal. And he is the author of the Existential Buddhist blog, also has written three books, Buddhism and Human Flourishing, A Modern Western Perspective, Living Zen, A Practical Guide to a Balanced Existence. And what I would like to say is, if you are curious about Zen, I can't think of a better person to learn from than someone who is a Zen Buddhist priest, but has investigated many of the other schools of Buddhism and comes from the background of being a retired clinical psychologist who also served as the assistant clinical professor at the Yale School of Medicine and was with them for almost 30 years. And this accomplished person was so giving of himself to all of us. Sure, he had a discussion with me, but because he knew, I believe truly, that it was a discussion that would be beneficial to many others. And I found him through his blog. I didn't know him. I found his blog. I wrote to him and asked him if he would have this discussion with me. And he answered yes almost immediately, or I'll say as immediately as as emails allow. And then he proceeded to sit and speak with me. And I just feel like throughout the entire discussion that he was really working to share his wisdom to draw upon stories that would be the most useful to us and to make some very salient points. He also happens to be one of the few who I spoke to who had an innate comfort with death. And at the time that I'm sharing that with you, I have spoken to about 12 different Buddhist teachers And of the 12, I think just two of them mentioned that from an early place, they were just comfortable with death, almost as if they were just born with that knowing and comfort of that this is a natural thing that occurs to us. And so that means that his grieving process has been different and that he's always been able to be with the dying. And this is something that I would like many of us to grow this this strength and develop our our skill set in this area because as you know it's not easy and if there can be a small army of us maybe a large army of us maybe army a militaristic term isn't the right way to say it a small peaceful army of those of us who can be with death and be with those who are around death then we can help bring more peace and awareness to others. And that's one of my goals in in having these discussions and and sharing them with all of you is to bring us to that place of, of peace and comfort and understanding. Well, he's retired now, but in his clinical psychology practice, he saw people through grief or not. And the reason I say or not is that some of us I want to say the phrase transcend grief, but when I say transcend grief, what I want you to know is that grief is always with us, but it isn't always really difficult or really hard. There will come the day where as part of your grieving process, you will smile and laugh more at the recollection of those who have gone, and you'll have more smiling and laughter than you will have tears and sadness. In some ways, grief is always with us. So when I say or not, there are some people who maybe for the time 
that we know them don't seem to get to that place where they can have more smile and smiles and laughter. And it's a different path and time for all of us, certainly. But there is one woman who he recalls whose son had died and he had been on life support and the doctors had recommended that he be taken off life support. And she always regretted that. There was that part of her who would rather have had him quasi alive than truly dead. And and she tried to bring him back from the grave. But then there's the man who in the course of a week lost his job and his mother died. That's a, that's a darn difficult week, I think. It depends. It turns out that for him, it was a horrible job. And his relationship with his mother was not amazing. And what he began to feel was freedom. Like a weight had been lifted off of his shoulders by both of these events. And within the course of a couple of weeks, he left therapy because he didn't feel like he needed it anymore. And then there's the woman who went through the loss of a child, which, you know, we've already discussed the woman who tried to bring her son back. I think that must be one of the most difficult losses. I think that must be one of the most difficult losses. I, I never like to see parents have to go through losing their children. It's, it just seems so heartbreaking. And this woman, she envisioned her grief as a whole. So when she sat with it, when she meditated and she sat with her grief, she pictured it as a whole. And at first it was this big, scary, gaping hole. And eventually she sat a little closer to that hole. And eventually she started tending to the hole. And then she started watering it. And then flowers grew. And basically, in her own process, in her own way, What she created was a grief garden. She turned it into a a beautiful garden. And that is how she saw herself through her grief. Was a reminder of the power that we do have within ourselves and the strength that we do have within ourselves that maybe you don't know you have, but I bet that you do. And it comes down to something that uh, Seth said is, however you're feeling, that's fine. However you are feeling, that's fine. And something he went on to say was that sometimes this is like the weather. And as he was describing that sometimes our emotions while going through grief and dying and dealing with all that is like the weather, he was referencing when his first wife was going through her terminal illness. She was terminally ill with cancer. And he just said, you know, some days are stormy, some days are sunny. Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry, but it, it's all part of it. And we, it's good for us to remember that our feelings do not have to stay the same. We are not defined by those feelings. We are not those feelings. So whatever you feel, it's fine. Like the weather, it's going to change. Some days you are going to be thrilled with the weather. Some days you're not going to be thrilled with the weather, but it doesn't define you. And you don't have to hang on to that. You don't have to be in a dark, stormy place for the rest of your life. But how do we move on? How do we move on? And and he presented to me, you know, the, the reminder that, you know, human beings, we're living organisms, right? We want to flourish We want to flourish and our ability to flourish means when we are faced with obstacles, we need to move around them. Well, what is a bigger obstacle than dealing with grief and death and difficult, sad emotions? I don't know. That's a pretty big obstacle. And what he shared with me is that there are two things that really define how or if or when we are going to be able to move around the obstacle. The first being our internal resources and the second being our social and physical environment and the support that we have available to us. 
and this made a great deal of sense, and I appreciated the way he framed it, sometimes you will hear me frame it as running a marathon. And just know that anytime I talk about running a marathon or running at all, I'm also laughing at myself. Sometimes inwardly, today I'm laughing out loud and telling you that I'm laughing at myself because I don't run. I am that person who loves to say, if you see me running, there's a bear. And I stole that from a t-shirt. Like I didn't make that up, but this is how I feel. I'm not a runner. Despite my lack of enthusiasm for running, I will still say that getting ready for death and dying is like preparing for a marathon because I do envision that should I change my mind one day and fall in love with running, I'm not going to just spring up that day and jump out there and run a marathon without training, without a lot of thought and planning and training and stretching and resilience, resistance training, pardon me, and uh, nutrition and it's, it's all overwhelming to me, but training for being strong enough to handle grief and death and dying. I use the marathon analogy. I really appreciate his further explanation of it's really our internal resources and our social and physical environment. So think about that from a Buddhist perspective, our internal resources, our practice, our meditation practice, our ability to develop equanimity, our ability and our relationship with the Four Noble Truths and impermanence, and our social and physical environment that might be sitting with a group or working with a teacher and all the other things that we may or may not have available to us. And without having those two things, without building our internal resources and without having the right support, it's a difficult, it's a more difficult experience. The experience is difficult, but getting around the obstacle, really how, when, or if comes back to those two things, internal resources and social and physical environment. And in grief, our grief is a type of protest. We're protesting a separation from something that was part of us or someone, right? Someone who was part of our lives, someone who we were bound up with, someone who we got some of our feeling of perhaps security and safety and well-being. And we don't want them to be gone. And even if it's someone who was difficult or abusive, part of our story is bound up in that. And so the grief we experience might be different. Just like a few episodes ago when I spoke with Venerable Dae Hong and we we talked about the challenges that come up from when you are grieving and the person that died you had a traumatic relationship with right? But that protesting, that separation, again, another reminder of impermanence and our acceptance of impermanence will help us with clinging and aversion, which helps us be released from suffering. And one of the final lessons I'll I'll wrap up with today, again, there's so many, so many wisdom bombs, I'll call them, bomb in a positive way, like where um, Seth just quietly will say something, but there's so much depth to it. Those are his wisdom bombs, for which I will be forever grateful. And uh, a reminder, death, that the awareness of death helps us get on with what we are here to do. When we remember that we have a finite amount of time and we don't know what that time is. What a great reminder to just get on with what it is you are here to do. And that it's always time to live well. Living well, not necessarily meaning, you know, party it up and live in the lap of luxury. Living well, meaning practicing your Buddhism diligently and ardently living well, and treating people well. 
And what a model he was in talking to me in order to be helpful to all of us and showing me what it's like to live well and to treat other people well. This has been the Death Dhamma Podcast with Margaret Maloney. Thank you for being here. Your reviews and comments are greatly appreciated. And please come find me on margaretmaloney.com. M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I. And don't forget to check out Carpooling with Death, How Living with Death Will Make You Stronger, Wiser, and Fearless, available in all your favorite formats over on Amazon. And most importantly, may you be well. May you be happy. May you be safe, at ease, and free from suffering. Bye for now.